The, the challenges for ferrous melters with the current charged materials that are available generally fall into two categories. One is uh, those materials that are contained either on or within the steel scrap that can cause not a metallurgical problem but an environmental problem. That is zinc and aluminum and other galvanized coatings on steel scrap that are released uh, upon heating and melting. The other is metallurgical issues with the kinds of elements that we're now seeing and the levels of these alloying elements that we're now seeing in steel scrap. All manufacturing is always looking for an improvement, a way to increase, decrease cost, but, but not sacrifice properties. So what we see today is increases in elements like vanadium. Typically in the past we would never see much over 0.02 vanadium, now we're seeing levels at 0.05 and higher, and vanadium is a pretty strong carbide stabilizing element, both in gray and ductile iron. Number two, molybdenum. Molybdenum is a great hardenability element, it allows one to have stronger heat treated structures, and in some gray irons we do alloy with molybdenum, and in some ductile irons, however we don't generally get as high as we can see when we start using more and more steel scrap that contains 0.25 to 0.4 percent molybdenum. Titanium, uh, a known graphite shape active element, uh, previously not really included in many steel scraps, now is in the territory of 0.05 percent in some steel scraps as well. In gray irons, that titanium tends to round the graphite flake and reduce tensile strength in gray cast iron. In ductile iron, the titanium is a very graphite shape active element and makes the production of nice round spheroids in ductile iron almost impossible. In fact, the early CG iron, compacted graphite iron irons, were made with an intentional addition of titanium to inhibit that graphite shape uh, formation. Boron. Boron is being added to more and more steels for bake hardenability and for other strength improvements. The boron has a kind of an opposite effect of most other alloying elements that we are cautioned about. That is to say that boron, uh, and the mechanism is not 100% clear and this is uh, in need of more uh, research, but the boron interferes with the perlite stabilization of both manganese and copper in ductile irons. Uh, we know that the, the boron uh, segregates somewhere near the graphite nodules and it is theorized that the boron and copper perhaps form some kind of a copper borate, neutralizing copper's effect to inhibit uh, solid state movement of carbon from the matrix into graphite nodules. Uh, we're starting to see more levels of niobium, and there's been very little, if any, research work done on levels of niobium in either gray or ductile iron of 0 0.03, 0 0.02, which is very possible to see with the levels of niobium that we see in some steels today. The other challenge is that we are seeing combinations of alloying elements and higher levels of alloying elements. And, and as we advance in the steel world to these uh, complex phases, we're seeing more combinations of alloys. Titanium plus chromium plus possibly boron, or vanadium plus titanium, or chromium plus manganese, or, or other, other combinations. This is not a uh, a, this is not a sin being committed by the, the steel industry. This is not to demonize the steel industry. They are answering the metallurgical call of how do they make higher strength to weight, weight ratio products. It's uh, indicative, however, that we here in the iron business need to stay uh, vigilant and learn as much as we can about where they're going to go with alloy levels, where, because we will see the effect of those alloys as that scrap stream comes to us as one of our basic fundamental charge materials in the production of gray and ductile iron castings.